Uh, family, we have a, a word today, and I want to invite you to open up your scripture, open up your Bible, turn on your phone, your app, whatever it is that you use. If you have a physical Bible on you, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to start briefly with a short word of prayer just to kind of get us focused back into the word again, and, uh, and we'll be talking from the theme, with our eyes open. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity we have to open up your scripture again. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to come together as a family. We are a family in Christ. And Lord, we have displayed, displayed already some family traits as we have sung together and, and interacted and prayed. And, and in a moment as we study and as we partake of the Lord's Supper, God, we are embracing one another as family. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you may speak to us to, come, to, to, to bring in our hearts conviction that we can continue to live out the life that Jesus intends for us to have. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just as a way of surveying the room, I, 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 I know um, uh, my, my, my friend and colleague and sister Ines last week, he, she came to preach. I don't know about you, I was like amening. I was out in Ensenada for a wedding, and I was so blown away by her message last week. I was so blessed how uh, she, she preached uh, arroz con fe, and she brought the whole rice-making uh, metaphor to illustrate kind of the process of faith and the legacy that many of us have of, of la abuelita and, and las tias and the mothers and the faith. Today we wrap up with our series that we have titled Café con Fe, and it is really a series where we kind of, uh, we, 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 we engage the topic from the intersection of culture and faith. And, and this is how we are closing our Latin American faith, uh, Latin American heritage faith, uh, Latin American heritage month sermon series, uh, speaking about the Latin American faith. Uh, today, we wrap up with, with, with communion. Now, as a way of survey, I see quite a bit of Latin, Latin American in the room. Just, just, at, just indulge me here for a moment. I just want to see how many of us grew up in a traditional Spanish church. Just shoot up your hand. All right, all right. So you look around. There's quite a bit of us in the room. We know like tra traditional Adventist church, Hispanic Adventist church. Like, you know the diaconisas with the white gloves. That, that was your tia, right? That was your mama right there, right? You know, the deacons, the deacons who would wear the diacono badge on Sunday. They weren't even in church. They were at the, at the store, but diacono, right? You, you, so we know, we know traditional Spanish church. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, legacy that we have. It has its quirks, but it, it, is, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to come from. If you are from that background, if maybe if you're not, uh, we want to let you in on a little bit. Hispanic Avenue churches is that we would spend all day in church. No, 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 no. You think like all day, I mean, you're out by 12 or 3. I'm talking about. All day. I'm talking about you show up at 7.30 in the morning for Bando de Oración, right? If you're a Sabbath school teacher, 8 o'clock, you got clase de maestros. 9 o'clock, you got the Sabbath school program, not class. There was a whole worship program at 9 in the morning, right? Bienvenida, lectura biblica. I mean, it was like a mini service. So we, you really went to church twice in a row. You would have Sabbath school, then you would break up into classes, come back and have church all over again. You would stay for potluck to, if I may, may argue, the absolute best potlucks in all the world. Okay? And then you would stay for juntas. And if you did not stay for juntas, you know your mama stayed for juntas because you, you live in the car in the parking lot at your Adventist church. Can I hear an amen? amen. Uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, so we would spend all day. And then, and then the reason we would spend all day and the reason things were scheduled that way we, because after juntas, there was this thing called... Sociedad de Jóvenes. You know, AY, where all the old folks would come in. <laughs> no, there were some young people in the room as well, but 
It was meant to be a, a, a youth thing, but the truth is the adults would kind of take over and we would just hang out outside most of the time. And then after that, we would hang out for sociales. There was always some, you know, venta de comida, tamalitos, pupusas. There was always something. And we would end up getting home at around 10 o'clock, 11, just completely exhausted from resting on our Sabbath. Yo, Hispanic Church is an amazing, amazing legacy to have, and I'm, I'm grateful for that legacy. Uh, as I've kind of grown and understood part of the nuances of the Hispanic Church, one of the things that impacted me the most was the reason why we spent all day in church. Why do we spend all day in church? Why is it that, that especially immigrant communities, and this is, the, this is true also of Asian American communities and other ethnic communities here in the United States, whenever you have an ethnic community that is a faith community, most likely what you will see is that they spend all day. In church, one of my professors, my mentor, is actually Korean American, and, and it, it, the way he described church, it is exactly the way I just described church. It was the same exact pattern, the same exact length, except they would meet on a Sunday, uh, and, 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 and it hit me. There's something that we share with other ethnic groups. There's a, a part of our story that almost drives us to want to spend time together. And, and, and here's here's a phrase I want to I want I want to share with you. This is this is a concept of why we end up gravitating and why we end up hanging out all day together on Saturday. Are you here? Displacement. Displacement. Feeling like we're not at home. Feeling like we are not fully fitting into society. You see, most. Immigrant communities, because there is still a yesterday in their home. There's still an out there. There's still uh, this, 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 this longing for home. And, and, and they navigate a space here in this new country where they don't always quite fit in. The displacement of that experience makes us long for family. When you go to a Spanish church, you don't get asked. If you're a visitor, you don't get asked, what do you do for a living? You get asked, what church do you come from? Yo, what's your tribe? Who's your, who are you rolling with? We're more worried about belonging. There's something to that. There's something to that, and I want to bring your attention now to 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 17 and on, because the context of communion, this is, this is the passage that we read every single time we have communion. This is the passage that we, we turn to. This is Paul writing about communion, and the context of this is a context of family. I was actually going to name today's sermon Familia, but uh, uh, we, we, I'll explain to you my title in a moment. But, but there's something powerful about the way communion and family are tied together. So open up your scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 and on. And I'm going I'm to go ahead and read in your hearing as, as we set the stage together, okay? But in the following instructions, I do... Not commend you, says Paul, because you, when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, and he's saying, hey, 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 so, so you got a lot of good things going on for you, but the truth is, I'm about to point out some stuff that you're not doing so hot in. Like, I can't compliment you on what I'm about to mention. He says the following. In the first place, verse 18 When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe that in part. So Paul, 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 he is about to write about communion. And he is writing to Corinth saying, hey, so so I I got a lot of ways to compliment you. But let me tell you something. There is this one thing I cannot compliment you in, is, and, and that is the following Corinthian church. The, re, the beef I have with you, the complaints I have about you, is that you are too cliquish. You got too many clicks. 
You got too many divisions. So, so, so he, he's speaking, to, he's writing to them and he's saying, you are too divided. And in their case, the way they were divided is that they had the wealthy Corinthians and the poor Corinthians worshiping together. And guess what? The wealthier Corinthians would only hang out with the wealthy Corinthians and the poor Corinthians would hang out together. The educated Corinthians would hang out and they would go out to coffee shops together and the uneducated ones would hang out and they would never uh, uh, have communion or community with those who were educated. There were clear lines in that one single church. Now, what this tells me is that the God of the Bible, the God you and I worship, cares about cliques. He cares about people feeling left out when, it's, when we are in community. So much so that he brings it up in the context of communion and he said, hey, I cannot commend you for what you're doing. Yo, family, as I was, I, I wrote my notes earlier this week and, and as I was wrestling with this last night, I was already in bed. I was already, it was like two in the morning. I'm like praying through this thing. And quite frankly, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very honest. You know, I like to be candid here. This led me to Repentance on behalf of myself and on behalf of, the, of our church. This led me to repentance. The God of the Bible cares about who we exclude and who we include. The God of the Bible, to him it matters, to God it matters that some people may click together and exclude other people. And family, let's be very honest. I love the diversity in our church. We have millennials. We have a bunch of kids. We have more seasoned saints. We got different, different cultures, different ethnicities. But let me tell you something. This is an area we need repentance in. This is an area we need to do better in. And, and I think it's so timely that God would bring this up today when we're about to gather around this table. Letting us know, hey, clicks matter to me. So Paul is writing to Corinth. And he's saying, I can't, I, I can't compliment you for this. You guys are failing at this thing. You're too divided. You got too many cliques and family. I understand. I, I love the fact that we call one another family. I love the fact that we call this thing a home. But the truth is, we got some work to do. Can I hear an amen? And I want to hear an amen from someone who's willing to put in the work. Somebody who's willing to reach across to someone you don't know for the sake of keeping the integrity of the family and honoring and glorifying God. So Paul, Paul, Paul is writing to them. He's writing to them. Watch how verse 20 continues. He continues uh, making some observations to uh, the church in Corinth. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. I mean, that, that alone ought to make you just kind of step on your rakes a little bit and, and, and ask yourself if you could be making the same mistake. Paul is about to write about the Lord's Supper, about communion, but he tells the Corinthians, when you get together to have communion, that's not communion. When you get together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you may be having a snack, but that's not communion. You may be, you may be having a snack together. You may be, you know, sitting around the table, but that is not my table. That is not the Lord's Supper. And notice why, uh, why, why, why Paul says this. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another one gets drunk. And then he says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I condemn you in this? No, I will not. Corinth was having an issue. There was people who were wealthy in the church. They had money. They didn't have to work that much. So they would come to, they would come to these gatherings and they would sit around the table. They didn't have to worry about working. They had people working for them. They would sit around the table, start enjoying the wine, start enjoying the bread, start enjoying 
the entire feast, they would eat and eat and eat and eat. Meanwhile, some church members were still out in the field. They were still out in the vineyard. They were still working. And by the time the poor church members would come around the table, that our Bible needs to be marked up. And there's, there needs to be a journal somewhere where you're writing down your prayers. How many of us believe in time alone with the Lord? Amen. I hope you say amen to that. But let me tell you something. It is a mistake when we think that all of our spiritual experience is only individualized. And we are ignoring the fact that God has called us not just a a body part. He's called us a body. And we are supposed to see the spiritual life as something we do as a family. We do it together. And what was happening in the Corinthian church is that they were so focused on the personal aspect of it. They were completely unaware that my neighbor on the right and my neighbor on the left were going hungry as I was getting filled. They were so focused on worship, they were unaware of the broken people. Uh, Let me speak to you, Kaleo, for a moment. Let me land this right where you're sitting right now. It's so easy to come to church on Sabbath morning and say amen and sing hallelujah and proclaim healing is here, healing is here, healing is here, and not realize that there's someone who needs healing who's sitting right next to you. It's so easy to say, oh, Lord, Jesus comes as a bride waiting for her groom, right? We're looking for that day when Jesus is coming, not knowing that there is a broken life sitting across the aisle from you. But you are so focused on that personal relationship with Jesus. You are ignoring the fact that Jesus, when he sat around the table, he sat not just in front of Peter, he sat in front of John, Let let, let me explain that concept for a moment. A lot of times when we come to communion, when we come to worship, it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. The picture of communion is a disciple sitting at the table with God. Yo, think about that for a moment. A human sitting at the table with God next to Peter, next to John. Next to Matthew. You see, it wasn't a booth at a restaurant, seat for two. It was a communion table. And God is present, but so is your neighbor. So the Corinthian church was getting this wrong. They were so focused on themselves. They were so focused on, 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 on just, just that me and Jesus. They were forgetting the fact that, that there was other people that God had already grafted them into. This new family that they, were, they had been grafted into. And family, let me tell you something. I want to I just challenge you this. From now on, I, I dare you. And I know you may, you, it may, may look a little creepy at first. But, but if people see you do it, they'll understand what we mean if they're they're here today when we're in worship look around the room look around the room look at your neighbor down down the aisle over there with tears in his eyes Look, look look at him look at him look at your sister in the bag lifting up her hands look at her and watch your heart swell with love when you realize yo we're in this thing together man I'm not just broken alone. I'm not just worshiping alone. Jesus is not just my savior alone. We are in this thing together. We are the household of God. We're a family. See, the Corinthians had forgotten the fact that they were family. Some people were getting filled. Other people were getting ignored. Some people were getting uh, drunk. Other people were thirsty. says, no, 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 this is not the Lord's Supper. You guys are in this together. It's only the Lord's Supper when it's communion, not just you and I. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, can, can, can I read Ephesians 2, verse 13 and, and, and verse 19? I want to show you two, two, two verses from Ephesians. I promise I'm not going to keep you long. Um, Ephesians 2, 13 and 19. I want, I want to read that, and I'm going to read it off the screen. I won't even turn in my Bible. I, I want you to see the language that is being used here, okay? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's such a powerful verse. Can we just say amen to that? Because each and every one of us were far off at one point, but the blood of Jesus Christ has brought us near to the heart of the Father. Amen? 
That's such a powerful, powerful verse. Can we read verse 19 together, though? Because this kind of makes sense of that previous statement. Can we read that together? One, two, three. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Many of us were taught an individualistic. Is that literally all it says right there, bro? Okay, let's go to the next one. That I'm trying to fill in the gaps here. I don't know what happened uh, with the slides. The church is an instrument for strengthening our faith. The church is an instrument that God uses to continue proclaiming the gospel. And all this may be true. But in all of these statements, it seems that one can speak of the gospel apart from the church. So whenever we say, hey, the church is, is, is a place for us to kind of gather and preach the gospel, or the church is when we come to hear the gospel, or the church is when we come to proclaim the gospel, that's, that's great. It's true, but it almost seems like the gospel and the church are two different things. But watch this. But for people whose experience of the gospel is that we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, the church is part of the gospel itself. So part of what God wanted to give you when he gave you salvation was a family. He didn't just want, you see, you think God wanted to give you a mansion in heaven. You think God was after the street of gold. You think God just simply wanted to give you a ticket to get out of here and go to the pearly gates. No, 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 family. It's not just eternal life. God, as part of the gift of salvation, he has given you a family and that family is called the church. Watch the gospel. The good news is not only that our sins are forgiven and we have been reconciled with God, it is also that we are citizens and family with the saints and with God. Justo Gonzalez. The book is called Santa Biblia. You know, uh, my, my dad tells me of how he grew up in, 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 in his childhood. And I think at one point in his life, his house held about 30 people, primos, tios. It was about 30 people, you know, living in his house. Now, now if you ask me, that's crazy. <laughs> um, I, 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 I like my space. I like my privacy. I like to have a room. I like to have an office. But, but if, if you were to look at your Parents and grandparents, oh, we had 12 people in the house. Oh, we had 20 people in the house. And you know, you know, what's, you know what's fascinating? In society, before the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century, family was that. It wasn't mom, dad, and the three kids. It wasn't mom, dad, and the single child. Family leading up to the Industrial Revolution was everybody. Grandma, grandpa, all their siblings, all your tios and tias, everyone and their dog was a part of the family. And you know what's fascinating? That's how the church is supposed to be. This idea that my family is just the five of us. Now, I'm not trying to open the doors to all of you to come move into my house. That's not what I'm saying. But the truth is, when it comes to the gospel, my table gets bigger. And it's not just the five of us. It's not just the 20 of us. It's all of us because of Jesus. Amen? Now, th that, that opens up the potential to some really crazy stuff, though. Because I know you guys are that crazy relative as well. I know you got that uncle that you don't like to look at in the eye. I know some of you got that cousin that you can't stand and that, aunt, that auntie that gets on your nerves. And the thing is this, the bigger the table gets with God, the more the potential for there to be some outliers at that table. 
some annoying people at the table, some obnoxious people at the table. And let me tell you something. The church has a tendency to reduce the size of a table, and yet God has a tendency to make it that much bigger. Uh, back when I started my, my ministry, I was uh, about 24. Four or 25 years old I was in my first church assignment and I was I was sent to another little church that we were overseeing and and given the task to lead communion there um, so I went to lead communion and there was this elder uh, this leader in the church who was very authoritarian like the guy wanted to be the final word in absolutely everything so we stood up in the front and I'm standing next to this elder and the elder said look you I, I know you're the pastor but you're going to do everything I say like the emblem, like the body of Christ in the blood right in front of us, right? We're about to lead communion. It's a spiritual moment, and he's whispering over, I know you think you know what you're doing, but you're going to do everything I say. He's whispering right here, completely spiritual moment. So, so I'm listening to him, and he's like, okay, now, now do this, now say this, and I'm following every single instruction. I'm nervous. I've never done this thing before, and I have a bunch of strangers in front of me. He's giving me instruction after instruction after instruction, and then he says, right before we were about to pass out the emblems, he says, now what I need you to do is dismiss the visitors. I'm like, what, what do you mean? Yeah, dismiss the visitors you can only participate in the table if you are a member of this church i can't do that dismiss the visitors i can't do that dismiss the visitors you see in the mind of this brother the table of god kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller but the god of the bible is the kind of god that makes the table bigger and bigger and bigger so much so that your crazy auntie belongs your crazy uncle belongs Yo, your crazy self belongs around this table. Can I hear an amen? This table is big enough even for you. The table of God gets bigger, it gets bigger, it gets bigger. And, 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 and you see that in the gospel story. I mean, come on, you ever think uh, sharing a meal with someone who betrayed you? Jesus shared it with Judas. You ever think of sharing a meal with someone who denied you? Hey, he shared it with Peter. You ever think of, of sharing a, a, a meal with someone who had trust issues with you? Hey, he shared it with Thomas. If you've ever wondered, oh, I can never share a, a meal with someone who turned their backs, Jesus shared it with 12 disciples who walked away from him moments after the meal the table of God gets bigger because we're family grafted into the, 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 the blood uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ into the body of Christ the table of God gets bigger it gets bigger it gets bigger in his mind we are a family and we gather around this table as a familia as a family with our eyes open trying to remain aware what you need what you need what you need what I need it's not just about me and him it's about all of us the passage we usually read for communion I want I want to read it to you now I want, I want to read it, and I want you to look at the language. This is what we repeat every time we have communion. It's going to be on the screen. It starts in verse 23 and on, and it says the following, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he, be, when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is in you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know what's mind-blowing about this? Uh, so, so I took the liberty. This is, this is translated from the English standard uh, version. I, I took the liberty to tweak the language a little bit to the Manny standard uh, version f for you for a moment. Just, just a different translation that I believe would be more accurate to what the text is actually saying. Notice how every single time Jesus speaks to you, it's not you, it's you all. Watch. Verse 23 again. For I received... From the Lord, what I also delivered to you all, 
that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you all. You all do this in remembrance of me. Notice the plurality there. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you will drink, as you all drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you all eat this bread and drink the cup, you all proclaim the Lord's death until we come. You know what? Have you noticed how every time we have communion, I'm going to push you, I'm going to push you, I'm going to push you. Every time we have communion, we instruct people, to close their eyes afterwards and have alone time with Jesus. So, so take it and close your eyes. But the truth is communion is where you're supposed to eat with your eyes open. It's called communion. If God would have wanted you to have a private meeting with him, he would have given you a booth, not a table. He would have given you a prayer closet, not a table. But he says, no, 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 you all. In his mind, it's always we over me. Does this make sense, church? It's we over me. So, family, as as we get ready to to take on communion today, we want to do it today with our eyes open. We want to have a moment as a family where we close this series of Latin American faith, celebrating the fact that we are a familia. Now, we may not spend all day in church, not from 7 in the morning to 11 at night. Let me hear you say a loud amen. Amen. (laughs) But the truth is that we are a family. And when I come to church, I need to be aware of what you're going through, Gabriel. I need to be aware of what you're going through, Natalie. Natalie. Like, I need to be aware of what you're going through, Denise. That's, that's, what, that's why we're here. There is room for personal alone time with Jesus. It's called home. It's called your house. It's called your room. But when we come to this space, we worship, we praise, we're in communion with God, but we keep one eye on the Lord and one eye on our neighbor because we're in this thing together. In a moment, uh, I'm going to invite you to come up, and we're going to invite you to join us from the center aisle. We're going to take part of the bread. They're going to distribute it to you. We're going to invite you to come down the middle, go out towards the outside, back into your seat. I'm going to have the elders join me in just a moment, and they're going to have a couple readings for us and, and a couple prayers for us. The worship team is going to be leading as you walk up. When you go back, what we usually do as you participate, following our instructions, and you have time alone to pray. What we want to do today is just simply have us open our eyes, maybe to the person in front of us and the person behind us, next to us, and just spend a couple moments maybe exchanging prayer requests. And as you participate, pray for one another. And then Pastor Eman is going to close us off with prayer. Can we do that together? Can we stand where we are as, as a worship team starts uh, leading us in a moment? I'm going to open us up just a word of prayer to close this moment, transition us into communion. And the moment I say amen, you can start making your way down the aisle and join us up here to participate with communion. Loving God, thank you so much for giving us a table. You could, have, you could have created booths or, or closets, but you gave us a table because you wanted us to be sitting around the table with Jesus and with Peter, with Jesus and with John, with Jesus and with Thomas. And God, it matters that we look at one another. It matters that we are aware of the fact that we are in this thing together. It's not just about Jesus and I, it's about Jesus and us. We are a family. We have been grafted into the body of Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ. And God, today we want to enact enact that. We want to display that as we share in this communion table. So Holy Spirit, move in our hearts. Family, if you're a visitor and you feel nudged to come up, please come up. This table is big for a reason. It's for everyone. Jesus, thank you for making the table big enough 
even for me. Bless us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can come down the aisle and join us up here.